So the series, this is called The Conservative Mind, and we borrow that from the name of a, of a, of a book by Russell Kirk. And Kirk was probably one of the you know, major you know, founders, philosophical spokespersons for conservatism. If you had to do kind of a conservative Mount Rushmore at one point, right, you probably would have had Russell Kirk, William F. Buckley Jr., Ronald Reagan, and I don't know, maybe Barry Goldwater. I don't know, it might be, might, might be the fourth. But we, so we, we envisioned this series late 2010s, around 2018, 2019, because it was really clear that a lot of people calling themselves conservatives didn't really have a clear idea of what a conservative was. You could ask 10 different conservatives, self-identified conservatives for a definition of conservatism, you can get 10 different answers. And by the way, I think that's true for a lot of liberals, a lot of so-called democratic socialists, and a lot of other people as well. So who better to, to define this than uh, Grove City College, right? I mean, Freedoms College, as Lee Edwards calls us in his history of the college, the college uh, judged by the Princeton Review, most nostalgic for Reagan. So that's, uh, yeah, there you go. So that's, that's, that's our charge. Who could, who could do it better than us? So uh, Trustee David Porter is here, uh, President Paul McNulty. We started talking a few years ago. Let's, let's start a series on conservatism. So we kicked it off in 2022. The fall speaker, the kickoff speaker then was Jonah Goldberg. And then we had in the spring, we had Joe LaConte. Any LaConte students here, right? LaConte, LaConte was terrific. Last year, we had Dan McCarthy of ISI, was the fall speaker. And then in the spring, we had uh, Brad Berzer of Hillsdale and the Imaginative Conservative. And Brad, Brad Berzer is actually probably the top biographer of Russell Kirk. So our speaker, his lecture tonight is called The Conservative Mind at the End of Liberalism. So The Conservative Mind at the End of Liberalism. He is R.R. Reno, and that would be Russell Ronald Reno. All right, you guys got it? Known as Rusty, he was born in Baltimore, raised in Towson, Maryland, attended Haverford College as an undergraduate, and got his PhD from Yale in 1990 in, in religious ethics. So while in graduate school, he met and married Juliana Miller, with whom he's had two children, Rachel and Jesse. He received his first faculty appointment at Creighton University in 1990. He taught there for 20 years, and then he took an extended academic leave to work full-time at First Things, and he's never left, never left. Good choice, by the way, good choice. So R.R. Reno is now the editor and executive editor of First Things magazine. He's written many books, including Return of the Strong Gods, 2019, The End of Interpretation, 2022. He's written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Claremont Review of Books, Foreign Affairs, and more. I mean, a whole bunch of just every place you could probably think of in the movement. Some of his recent articles to give you an idea of what he's been writing about lately. Just a few days ago, he wrote on the post-Dobbs abortion reality. About a week and a half ago, a piece on the rhetoric of assassination, which was really good. And I, I recommend that, that you check out that piece. Show you how diverse his writings are. Before that, Clint Eastwood's Lonely Heroes. Before that, Fellow Travelers, God and the Rock Climber, The Republican Party Sidelines the Pro-Life Cause. Not one to be uh, real pleased about there. And also, um, why First Things is a nonprofit, and that gets me to the, the subject of, of First Things as magazine. So First Things is published by the Institute on Religion and Public Life. So that's a 501c3 nonprofit organization, like we are at the Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College. It was founded in 1989 by Richard John Newhouse, the late great Richard John Newhouse a Lutheran pastor who later became a Catholic priest, very well known. The Institute's mission is to advance a religiously informed public philosophy for the ordering of society, which sounds very Kirkian right, right there. The inaugural issue of First Things was published in March 1990. I subscribed right away, I could tell you that. The magazine's founding editorial was titled, Putting First Things First. Today, First Things includes the print magazine, which is published 10 times a year, and kudos on that. That is not easy to do to stay in print, 
nowadays. It's really difficult to keep a print magazine in print. Most of the print magazines that are in print aren't in print anymore. Uh, firstthings.com, which publishes daily web-exclusive articles. What I like, too, about the daily website is there's just a handful of new articles each day. So some websites you go to, and there's 30 or 40 new articles up there, and they, they disappear. And a lot of them aren't very thoughtful, but First Things really puts its time into giving you high-quality articles each day. They also do two regular podcasts, Conversations with Mark Berline and the Editor's Desk. In addition to publishing First Things, the Institute on Religion and Public Life sponsors a number of educational programs. The Erasmus Lecture, Evangelicals and Catholics Working Together, which is a terrific organization that's done great work. Established in 1994, brings together Protestant and Catholic scholars to issue joint statements on theological, cultural, and political issues. They don't always agree theologically, right? But, but you come together on the things that you agree on. They hold weekend intellectual retreats, seminars, the First Things Lecture in DC, a reading group, and many other events. The, among the longtime featured writers at First Things are good friends of ours, such as George Weigel, who we had here speaking to us again in April, last April. And of course, the great Carl Truman. Carl, where are you? Don't be shy. Put your hand up. There he is, who is a, who's a regular columnist and, and just, just writes excellent columns. Finally, and most relevant, First Things has become a place for really thoughtful dialogue and conversation on conservatism, on conservatism. President Paul McNulty, um, our trustee, Judge uh, David Porter, and others, they've been flagging for me First Things articles and print issues uh, on the subject of conservatism. And when we started the series, Rusty, they said right away, Rusty Reno needs to be one of the first speakers. You've got you to get him to this, to this series. And so with that, here he is, Rusty Reno. Welcome, sir. Good to have you. It's great to be with you. I'd like to thank uh, Paul Kangor and um, the Institute of Faith and Freedom for inviting me to be with you at Grove City College. This is my first time to Grove City College, and it's a beautiful campus, and I, I've, I've met some of the undergraduates and a and, uh, very impressive uh, group of young people here. So it's really a pleasure to be here. It's also an honor to be speak in the Conservative Mind series. Uh, I, when Paul was mentioning Jonah Goldberg, I immediately said, well, I'm kind of the anti-Jonah Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys can make up your minds whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I'll also like to um, echo the thanks to Carl Truman for being such a regular contributor to First Things. His voice has been very important for the mission of our publication. All right, so my, my, my title is The Conservative Mind at the End of Liberalism. A little bit optimistic, End of Liberalism. We'll see as we go forward. Well, to conserve means to keep and sustain. When we conserve something, we protect and save it. In earlier times, men were sensible of the need to preserve the fall harvest, laying up stores for the dark winter months. That sense about sensibility has not disappeared. In our commercial society, we save for retirement, harboring our resources against future needs. But I would submit that those things that attract our greatest devotion and most sustained efforts of protection are not simply useful in the way that the, uh, the grain harvest or the bank account is useful. We cherish some things for their own sakes. Our faith offers an example. We want to pass it on to our children because we regard it as an inestimable, something of an inestimable value. In a similar way, we cherish our natural heritage, our national heritage, or our family traditions. Now, the conservative sentiment is perennial. No society can endure, can endure without it. Yet, since the end of World War II, the conservative disposition has been often neglected. In this time period, innovation, 
diversity, transgression, and other motifs suggesting openness and limitless horizons of freedom have enjoyed the greatest cultural prestige. In my estimation, this emphasis on a bright, open future has dominated the cultural consensus during my lifetime. I was born in 1959. And I explain this consensus and its origins in my recent book, Return of the Strong Gods. I try to lay out, it's an it's a exercise in intellectual journalism, not real history, but I just try to sketch the origins of this now super dominant um, consensus in favor of a bright, open future. But the winds of ch change are blowing. We are living at the end of progressive confidence. That's my thesis tonight. We're living at the end of a kind of confidence that this dominant liberal consensus will, in fact, deliver a brighter future. Consider that in 2016, Donald Trump promised to build a, as he put it, big, beautiful wall. It's going to be big. It's going to be beautiful. And that campaign slogan involved more than construction plans and immigration policies. It's what literary scholars call a condensed symbol. Liberal is a condensed symbol. It was more than just a policy proposal. It was a symbol of something much deeper. And we could see this in the fact that liberal and many, uh, many so-called conservative commentators denounced Trump's wall talk as xenophobic. It's a sign that they saw it as a condensed, condensed symbol about whether we were going to be an open society or a closed society. And xenophobia, this is an unforgivable sin against the open society that has so long dominated our sense of what is true, good, and beautiful about America. And Trump supporters had the opposite reaction. They thrilled when he talked about the wall because they heard in that condensed symbol a promise, basically the promise, I will preserve our country. I think that's what they heard when they, when they heard him pronounce his commitment to that big, beautiful wall. Now, today, I don't want to talk about Donald Trump or Kamala Harris or any other political figure. My aim this evening is broader. I want to argue that the political imagination of the West is shifting. New motifs are emerging. And these motifs suggest protection, conservation, and consecration. In other words, a liberal or progressive era is giving way to a conservative one. This could seem overly optimistic, in, but I'm going to make my case that we're in the agony of the end of a very, a very long and powerful liberal era. In order to develop this, I want to look at Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I've written about Coleridge's um, political or social theories, better term for it, on a number of occasions. And, I'm, so I'm gonna, and it, it's to be found in his book on the Constitution of Church and State. Uh, typical Coleridge, uh, quite brilliant, peters off and never end. He never finished it. You know, too much opium or something like that for Coleridge. <laughs> or too much uh, depression, whatever it was that he suffered from. In the early 19th century, England underwent a liberal revolution in politics and an industrial revolution in the economy. Amidst these revolutions, Samuel Taylor Coleridge speculated about the conditions necessary for a healthy body politic. Not, uh, not unlike James Madison, who recognized that constitutional design ought to establish a separation of powers to check tyrannical impulses, Coleridge, like Madison, thought of society as a system and not just in terms of specific doctrines. He proposed what was in effect a cultural balance of power, one that should obtain between the forces of revolution, which he called the party of change, and those of conservation, 
which he called the party of permanency. Both parties, change and permanency, are necessary in the modern age, he argued, and neither should attain unchallenged supremacy. The party of change lacks any breaking mechanism. It is addicted to speed. Commercial interests do not hesitate to tear down buildings if profits are to be made by building new ones. I mean, you know, Oxford University would be raised to the ground if, it, if we had only had the party of change uh, in, in, because, you know, you could rebuild it and, you know, uh, uh, make more money. The same holds true for political and social reform, the part, problem with the party of change. The utilitarianism of Jeremy Bentham mandates the complete and immediate transformation of all laws, habits, and norms so that every aspect of society accords with the singular imperative of promoting the greatest good for the greatest number. I mean, what a revolutionary Jeremy Bentham was. Everything has to be uh, uh, reconstructed according to that single principle. Now, one need not ascribe to Jeremy Bentham's narrow morality to see the appeal of the party of change. There are always injustices in society, and who can object to efforts to remedy those injustices? Moreover, economic dynamism has produced material and technological advances. The party of change is, is this dynamic party. But the goods achieved by the party of change come at a cost. Men cherish as well as aspire. They have the need to consecrate as well as to invent. They love what is familiar as well as hope for what is better. Now the party of permanency answers to this human desire to conserve. It, this party, anchors society not by denouncing change or encouraging a fear of change, as many members of today's party of change assume. It's kind of common rhetoric. What's, why are people conservative? Well, they fear change. No, the truth is quite the opposite. Rather than fear, the party of permanency is animated by love. It cordons off aspects of life as sacred and inviolable. Commerce must stop on the Lord's Day. Marriage may not be subject to utilitarian calculations. The rule of law is sacred and must not be uprooted wholesale in the interests of reform. Historical and cultural memory are to be cherished, not repurposed toward the ends of social justice. Love's jealousy puts a break on the party of change. This you shall not touch announces the party of permanency. Now, neither the party of change nor the party of permanency is partisan in the narrow sense. They are what I would call cultural centers of gravity. I think of them as social parties, not political parties, cultural parties, not political parties. The businessman seeks profits, the artist presses against constraining conventions. These impulses stimulate change, but they are not ideological programs in themselves. The same is true for clergy, judges, and landed aristocrats whom Coleridge ranged among the party of permanency. Its members, the members of the party of permanency, have been loyal to dogmas, traditions, and established interests well before the modern era. And they sustain these loyalties out of conviction and not to oppose the party of change. Now, unlike the party of permanency, which has been a socio-cultural reality from time immemorial, so I think, I, th I find Coleridge persuasive here. The party of change and the party of permanency, they're cultural centers of gravity. They're, they're sensibilities, they're congeries of interests and passions and they represent these two different elements of society. One anchors, the other uh, uh, stimulates. And so with this in mind that, we, I think we can see that unlike the party of permanency, 
which has been, a, as I say, a sociocultural reality from time immemorial, conservatism arises in the modern context. You know, the, the party of permanence, they've always been a party of permanency, uh, uh, urge, you know, arguing that things cannot be desecrated, things cannot be repurposed. As an ism, conservatism as an ism is self-consciously opposed to the forces of change. And then Russell Kirk, whom, we're, uh, whom this series uh, honors, Russell Kirk described conservatism as the defense of, he called them permanent things. So I think we can, re we can frame that purpose to defend permanent things more precisely by using Coleridge's terminology. And I put it this way, conservatism seeks to buttress the age-old and formerly ascendant party of permanency in its contest, in its modern contest, against the newly powerful party of change. And I would just as an aside say that liberalism as an ism is distinctly modern as well. It formulates philosophies of freedom, equality, and progress to, dom to justify the dominance of the party of change in society. So liberalism in, as an ism says the party of change ought to be dominant. Conservatism as an ism says the party of permanency ought to predominate. Now various members of the party of permanency have specific commitments. The Presbyterian harbors Calvinistic convictions. A Catholic affirms different dogmas with equal ardor. A professor of literature is loyal to the Western canon. A judge cleaves to precedent. Married couples are faithful to their vows. Children honor their parents. Teachers insist upon respect for their authority. Now, properly understood, conservative, conservatism as an ism does not, does not operate at this level. A conservative may have convictions, in fact, surely has convictions. He cultivates loyalties, he honors authorities, but his social and political outlook operates at a more general level. The modern conservative, I would submit, endorses the spirit of conviction, the disposition of loyalty, and the proper role of authority. Let me give an example. Dwight Eisenhower once said, our form of government makes no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. Now, people find this amusing, and many have mocked Eisenhower's dogmatic agnosticism, paradoxically dogmatic agnosticism, but I think they are wrong to mock Eisenhower. His statement expresses the essence of conservatism as an ism it rests in a programmatic support for the party of permanency. Religion in general enjoys Eisenhower's approval, not for religious reasons, but because of a political judgment that was in truth widely shared by our nation's founders. And the judgment is this, and it's this, to wit, the authority of religion plays an indispensable role in anchoring the American experiment. I, you know, this is a common judgment in the, the found, among the founders that you need religion in order to anchor uh, democratic politics. The, dis the distinction between this or that religious conviction, as well as any other commitment to permanent things, and modern conservatism as an ism helps explain our experience, I would submit, our political experience. Coleridge himself supported the Church of England, not because it was a pillar of the party of permanency in his time, which it was, but also because he was a convinced Anglican. Yet it is not always so. Roger Scruton followed a long line of modern conservatives who, though not believers, or at least not unequivocal believers, strongly supported the authority and social influence of Christianity. I mean, Michael Oakeshott, I think, also falls into this category. And David Hume, perhaps, even. I mean, it's, uh, um, there, there's a long line of, of people who are ambivalent about Christian doctrine 
who strongly endorsed the social influence of Christianity. In fact, of late, Elon Musk and the noted atheist Richard Dawkins, they recently have voiced support for what they call cultural Christianity. And the same is true about marriage and sexual morality in recent decades. Camille Paglia famously denounced the moralistic progressivism of sexual reformers back in the 1980s. And she did so not because she subscribed to Christian precepts, but rather, as she argued, the old norms give indispensable drama and danger to the affairs of the heart. So in a sense, she was clearly not a fully subscribed member of the party of permanency. Nevertheless, she wished it to regain influence and to restrain the sexual revolution. It's an interesting case. She didn't, she does not subscribe to traditional sexual morality, Christian sexual morality, but she wished it to regain influence in society. And in that sense, Paglia ranged herself among the conservatives. Therefore, it's best to understand modern conservatism is rooted in a fundamental political judgment. And it's this. All things considered, the body politics, the body politic needs more permanence and less change. You know, a lot of my friends get very frustrated with me because I boil things down to very simplistic statements. And I have a book on biblical interpretation that I get criticized for this. It's just too simple. I don't talk about hermeneutics when I should, but anyway. And I'm doing the same thing now. Let me, just, let me state it again. I think conservatism comes down to a single political judgment. Our society needs more permanence and less change. If that's your all things considered judgment, you're on the conservative side. And this judgment transcends individual cir circumstances. A conservative may be divorced and yet, and yet endorse lifelong marriage. He may be gay, but he rejects gay liberation and argues that male-female reciprocity should be normative. You know, Andrew Sullivan sort of flirts with this kind of being a conservative. Or this person may be agnostic, but nevertheless, seek to accord social privileges to religion. Or he might be a creature of pop culture, but nevertheless defends the great books. Um, so I think it's quite possible to, you know, it, it's not your personal conviction, it's what is your political judgment? Which party needs to be supported? The party of permanency or the party of change? In America, the term liberal functions as conservatism's antonym unlike on, in, on continental Europe. In this camp, one also finds many true believers. John Dewey, John Rawls, and others theorize political and cultural change as the only way to realize our age's moral ideals and thus to serve the cause of progress. And many economists have touted the benefits of creative destruction. For decades, artists and critics have insisted that transgression unlocks true genius. These sorts of folks are leading members of the party of change. Nevertheless, as a political phenomenon, liberalism is not a theory. Although unlike conservatism, there are many theories of liberalism, it is not itself a theory. In its deepest sense, a liberalism arises from a judgment that runs counter to conservatism. To wit, all things considered, society is better off when we endorse and privilege the agents of change. Now, I know pious Christians who endorse political liberalism. I also have known professors who fiercely defend the Western canon against woke warriors, but who nevertheless insist that they are liberals. They are loyal to one or the other of the permanent things, yet they believe that our society is, for the most part, too narrow, too wedded to the past, too overburdened by outdated norms and superannuated authorities. Instead of supporting the party of permanency, of to which to some degree they are actual members, they believe that we need to encourage and empower the party of change. It's that overall judgment that makes them liberal, just as the overall Eisenhower judgment, we need religion I don't care what it is, makes him conservative. 
Now, perhaps in the 19, early 19th century, when Coleridge formulated his account of the tension that defines modern political life, things were different. But today, most of us, I would submit, have a kind of dual membership. I preach the permanence of marriage, but my retirement accounts prosper in accord with the principle of creative destruction. Many pious Catholics are ardent supporters of religious freedom, which any political historian would tell you is one of the signal achievements of the party of change. And the reverse is true. There are plenty of households anchored in lifelong marriage that fly the rainbow flag. I submit, therefore, that being a liberal or a conservative depends upon which side of our dual membership we privilege. Do we think society is at risk of stagnation? Are our greatest fears those of closed claustrophobia and arrogant complacency? These are char characteristic vices of the party of permanency. Or do we feel, fear social fragmentation, the disintegration of moral norms, and the destruction of the authorities that anchor our lives and make ordered liberty possible? These are ills that arise when the party of change is rampant and unchecked. In other words, what we judge to be the greatest dangers to the body politic and where we see the greatest promise, this will tilt us in either the liberal or conservative direction. Just as an aside, I want to emphasize that it's in, this is a prudential judgment. What are the greatest ills facing our society? Where is the greatest promise? So I think if you begin to see it this way, you, you start to stop hyperventilating about socialism or fascism or whatever it is that the current pundit class is trying to whip you up into a frenzy about. And you realize that, by and large, you disagree with Kamala Harris or J.D. Vance or who, Tim Walz or Donald Trump because you have a different view of what is the peril facing our society. And reasonable people can disagree about a big, vast question, like what's the greatest problem facing the United States of America? Um, so anyway, that side, I'll put aside the aside. So I think which side, of the, which side that we, which, how, you know, what we think of the greatest dangers and where we see the greatest promise, how we answer that question will tilt us in either the liberal or the conservative direction. And I would submit that the same holds for an era, uh, a, a period of time in a nation's history. It is liberal when the party of change is ascendant because the dominant consensus deems it to be the greatest force for good out there. An era is conservative when the consensus runs in the opposite direction and the party of permanency dominates. Put more concretely, an era is liberal when conventional and bourgeois people pretend to be transgressive and countercultural. You know, David Brooks, Bobo's in Paradise. You know, bourgeois conformist people pretending to be transgressive and countercultural. Then you know you're living in a liberal era. Hypocrisy is a compliment that vice pays to virtue. So whatever the social virtue is, the hypocrisy will, the direction of the hypocrisy will, will tell, us, tell us what kind of era it is. And an era is conservative when deviant, deviant outliers pretend to be upstanding defenders of inherited norms and established authorities. Now I take it to be self-evident from my comment about David Brooks, Bobo's in Paradise book. I take it to be self-evident that recent times have been almost entirely liberal in outlook and sentiment. Today's establishment strives to be as sympathetic and as accommodating as possible to dissent, critical assaults, and other forms of deconsolidation and disintegration. This is why university administrators were so paralyzed by pro Hamas protesters, because in a liberal era, the party of change, dissent, transgression, this has privileged status. This is what makes our society better in the long run. And so this is the disorientation of uh, leadership, our leadership class in, in, in the universities. Now, intellectuals are often frustrated by the conservative impulse. They want to know its principles. And perhaps you came tonight to learn about conservative principles. And this demand 
is understandable. Those who work with ideas, I'm among them, naturally a wish to discern the theoretical architecture of political commitments. But modern conservatism does not operate this way, nor, I would submit, does modern liberalism. The former is simply a preference for permanence. The latter simply privileges change. 19th century liberals, let me make my, briefly make my case. 19th century liberals were keen to unleash economic freedom. Early 20th century liberals turned to the administrative state and technocratic expertise as great engines of progress, the sort of Woodrow Wilson era. Since the 1960s, liberals have emphasized sexual freedom and other expressions of political liberty, ideals unimagined by the great liberal figures such as William Gladstone or Woodrow Wilson. I think it's foolish to point out that there are no principled continuities between these phases of liberalism. What matters is the all things considered judgment. The liberal, again, says society is better off when we gun the engines of change. And the same holds for conservatives. They throw their weight behind whatever forces in society promise to provide stability and continuity. An early 19th century conservative supported altar and throne while casting suspicion on the then new phenomenon of nationalism. Now, early 21st century conservatism call for renewed nationalism. I'm among them. Seeing in this modern sentiment a bulwark against the dissolving effects of globalization. During the Cold War, conservatives championed capitalism because they wished to encourage the economic strength of the American nation in its struggle against the Soviet Union. And today, a conservative may disparage, J.D. Vance, for example, may disparage unfettered global capitalism because he worries about its disintegrating effects. The same conservatism that opposed political innovations two centuries ago now urges respect for the constitutional rights that were formulated by liberals. And why do they do so? Precisely because these rights are often ignored by today's liberals who see them as impediments to the next stages of revolution and change. A number of pieces in the New York Times about how the Constitution is the problem. We need to get rid of the Constitution because it's standing in the way of you know, liberalism, of change. Again, the demand for consistency makes little sense. Conservatism as an ism means championing whatever provides stability, continuity, and renewed authority in public life. I've belabored this permanency and change thing, so I'll belabor it some more. <laughs> we have lived in the liberal era for many decades. In 1949, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. published The Vital Center. Although he did not mention Coleridge, he called for the restoration of the old balance between co continuity and change, between authority and freedom, between stability and dynamism. However, it was not to be so. In the aftermath of World War II, as I outline in my book, Return of the Strong Gods, an open society consensus emerged that blamed the authoritarian personality, for example, or the closed society. You have Karl Popper, open society, and its enemies. So you get this Manichaean sentiment that arises, um, that they blame the authoritarian personality for Auschwitz and the other evils that nearly shipwrecked the West in the first half of the 20th century. So thus, in spite of the efforts of Schlesinger and other wise liberals who understood the need for deep anchors, the post-1945 consensus eventually became hyper-liberal and hostile to permanent things. It censured the party of permanency as fascist, racist, homophobic, or guilty of some other crimes against the open society. The current conservative disposition, in other words, was suppressed. I see two Supreme Court decisions that foreshadowed the society-wide pivot away from a kind of balance between the permanency and change and towards a wholesale empowerment of the party of change. In 1941, the Gobitis case, in the, in the 1941 Gobitis case, the court held that school children could be forced to recite 
the Pledge of Allegiance. And in this case, some Jehovah's Witness parents have brought suit to exempt their child from the school's requirement of obligatory uh, Pledge of Allegiance for religious reasons. In his majority opinion, Justice Felix Frankfurter cited society's legitimate, legitimate interest in promoting national unity and cohesion. The country had recently endured a painful depression that threatened to set workers against owners, and war was on the horizon. So that decision came down in spring of 41 and Pearl Harbor, December 41. Only three years later in the Barnett case, or two and a half years later, in the, or two years later in the Barnett case, the court reversed itself. It was the same, it had to do with the same matter. Jehovah's Witness parents, Pledge of Allegiance. I think it was Jehovah's Witness parents, but it's Pledge of Allegiance. Could they be compelled? In the majority opinion, Justice Robert Jackson cited the dangers of enforced unity and the importance of individual liberty. In that short compass of time, those two years, elite opinion had shifted. Concerns about disintegration and fragmentation no longer dominated. We were, at that time, we were at war with totalitarian enemies. Now the leading concern was over-consolidation and the, the oppression caused by a too dominant majority consensus. Too, we, we, we want to beware looking too much like the adversaries we were trying to defeat. The solution, therefore, was to put an accent on liberalizing motifs and to empower the party of change. Let me give you another illustration here. My, part, my parents' generation, they were born in the early 1930s, came of age in the aftermath of World War II. They took the all-powerful middle-class consensus for granted. You know, sort of moral consensus, no sex before marriage, uh, you know, um, no children out of wedlock, and so on and so on. They took that for granted, and they worked to weaken it in order to make room for outliers, to make room for those who deviated from settled norms. But they always trusted that the basic, the center, would hold. My parents also came of age when the post-war economy ensured stable, well-paying jobs for most Americans. And to them, the promise of economic liberalization seemed self-evident. Moreover, they could presume a general pro-American patriotic sentiment. And so, while the flag burning of by college students in the late 1960s may have seemed extreme, they could presume that the solid, coherent national consensus could accommodate both protests and radicalism. They were loyal to the party of change because they were confident that permanent things would continue and would serve to anchor all these necessary, to their mind, reforms. And so by the end of the 1960s, our establishment, that is, that is to say the people who are in positions of power and influence, our establishment was increasingly and invariably described as liberal, as in the liberal establishment. And that's because the open society con consensus dominated. In the 1970s, neoconservatives made an effort to rebalance political culture in the direction that Arthur Schlesinger Jr. proposed. They pointed out that the liberal regime depends upon social capital it does not re renew. The sustaining the American culture of freedom will require buttressing marriage, patriotism, and religious piety, faith family flag. In short, neoconservatism argued that we need to rehabilitate the party of permanency at least to some degree. Irving Kristol, clear, clear figure in this, uh, the founder of First Things Magazine, Richard John Newhouse also. You know, I remember being in an uh, event with him 20, uh, well, he died uh, um, not 20 years ago, but yeah, it was about 20 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago, I was at a seminar, and he said some things, and I said, Richard, you really are a liberal, aren't you? He said, I like to think of myself as a conservative liberal. Uh, but I think that, that speaks to what, what the only kind of conservatism that's really possible in a liberal era is to be a break on the dominant party of change. Um, I mean, you could be a conservative conservative, but if you're, you're that, you're kind of just outside of the governing consensus. But if you want to be in, in, in a conversation with the governing consensus, I think 
his position as a conservative liberal, which is essentially what the neoconservatism was, was a kind of conservative liberalism, rebalancing, rehabilitating the part of change, trying to get that Schlesinger balance between continuity and change, freedom and authority. Unfortunately, the end of the Cold War put a stop to any rebalancing in the conservative direction. The demise of the Soviet Union was interpreted as a victory for the open society as overseen by the party of change. When he spoke at the United Nations in 1990, George H.W. Bush outlined the hoped for future. This is what he said. He envisioned a future, a world of open borders, open trade, and most importantly, open minds. The motif of openness dominated the next 25 years. In the 1990s, both Democrats and Republicans supported economic globalization. Both parties championed diversity. Liberalism, the judgment in favor of the party of change, became all powerful. This is why liberals supported gay marriage, even when they had misgivings. It is why they presently endorse transgender ideology, even though they have misgivings. The open society consensus that this liberal predominance, it will deem every agent of change to be a blessing. We just don't quite see how it's going to work out so favorably, but change is what is for the best. It's what realizes the, the best aspect of America. And that's why um, a, a liberal uh, might uh, uh, kind of envision you know, the Wall Street attorney, you know, he's 60 years old, uh, went to Yale Law School, you know, makes a ton of money, but he considers himself a liberal, and he has misgivings about aspects of progressive politics. But he says that, you know, but just in general, it's probably for the best. And that's the liberal judgment, all things considered. The party of change is driving things in the right direction. Now, Arthur Schlesinger foresaw the peril of liquid modernity. He understood that human beings have a need for belonging. And he was aware that atomized individuals, shorn of anchoring attachments, are vulnerable, insecure, and rarely free. The last 30 years of unfettered, unfettered liberal ascendancy have proven him correct, I would submit. The old middle class consensus that my parents took for grant, granted has disintegrated. We're not even allowed to distinguish between men and women. The economic system is ruthlessly competitive, offering little in the way of security. Our national heritage has been transformed into a burdensome passel of evils. White privilege, homophobia, patriarchy, settler colonialism, and so forth. Far from the forced unity that worried Justice Robert Jackson, we are living in a condition of disintegration. Disintegration of marriage, disintegration of functional male-female relations, disintegration of national coherence, and more. Now, I'm not a sky is falling Eeyore. The world is not about to end. But those who have eyes to see recognize that we're not suffering from too much permanence, too much national unity, and too much constraining moral authority. Our problems are of the opposite nature. To echo Karl Marx, all that is solid now melts in air. A liquid world is not hospitable. Not surprisingly, voters in the West are rebelling against the liberal judgment that we need more and more change, more and more openness, more and more disintegration. Some describe this new sentiment as populism, but I would submit that this word identifies a symptom, not the cause. The populace is in rebellion because ordinary people do not want to live in a fluid world committed to never-ending revolution. To be human is to seek dry land. We naturally desire a stable home in which we can find protection, familiarity, and rest and the party of permanence, as I've said, ministers to this desire. Thus my thesis tonight. We are on the cusp of a new era in the West, one that will be marked by a conservative consensus, not a liberal one. The current political scene offers signs of the pivot toward the party of permanency. 
In Europe, the war in Ukraine has undermined confidence in the dream of an open world governed by, governed by the ever dynamic, now globalized party of change. Germany recently reimposed border controls in order to stem the tide of those seeking asylum. I mean, you know, border controls, that's, that's, a, that's, not, an, that's not an open society move. That's a close, closing of society move. Now, in this country, both candidates for president promised to reindustrialize our economy. Both compete to give money to mothers of newborns. Broadly understood, these are policies of reconsolidation, you know, um, realizing we have a fertility problem, we've got a, um, a hollowed out um, industrial base. And we're also seeing a backlash against the anti-police rhetoric of 2020. Even progressive havens such as San Francisco are cracking down on crime and hustling the homeless off the streets. There seems to be a tentative consensus that we need to make normal, normal again. Now the open society consensus will not die easily. I'm not saying change is coming easily or tomorrow. It's sure to scream that, that the rising conservatism is fascist, racist, homophobic, authoritarian, or otherwise bent upon oppression. In fact, it's not that it will do so, it is already doing so. And truth be told, some of this anxiety is not unmerited. The party of permanency has been demonized for decades. Its members have been driven out of the establishment, which is now almost entirely in the hands of the party of change. And therefore, their return, the return of the members of the party of permanency, will inevitably feel like an invasion of barbarians or maybe even worse, a takeover by Latin mass aficionados. <laughs> Beware. But return they must. I mean, this is a kind of restatement of the thesis in my Return of the Strong Gods book. But return the party of permanency must. Liberalism has failed. Not as a theory, here I differ from my friend Patrick Deneen, which after all it never depended upon, but rather as an all things considered judgment giving all power and prestige to the party of change. And meanwhile, to denigrate, all the while denigrating the party of permanency, to do this has severely damaged our society. The open trade that George H.W. Bush envisioned has hollowed out the economies of the West. The open borders has given rise to unprecedented demographic change that threatens the very survival of national cultures. And open minds have become empty, cynical, and nihilistic. And liberals' failure beckons conservatism's ascendancy. I just think it's just a, you, it, 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 I mean, we can maybe, talk, if we have Q&A, we can talk about some more other signs. But as this all things considered judgment changes always for the best, the party change should always be given privilege and priority. Uh, as, this, as this does this damage that's increasingly evident, it's just inevitable that conservatism will return and the all things considered judgment in favor of permanency will be restored. Now what this new conservatism will look like in detail I cannot say. But of this fact I am sure. A new all things considered judgment is poised to gain the upper hand. It will, it will hand over the reign of power to the party of permanency. Now I want to say as a kind of concluding remark so I'm making my historical thesis, my prediction, my prophecy even uh, about the re return of, of a kind of, con of this conservative judgment. But I want to make an observation, theological observation, to end with this. Christians need to recognize that the gospel is what I call a strong God. It is a fixed point in our whirling world. But it is also a revolution. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. You, you can't read the Beatitudes and not recognize the, um, the revolutionary character of Christianity. But neither the strong God of the gospel, the fixed point, nor the revolutionary reversals make Christianity conservative or liberal, make us as Christians conservative or liberal. To be one or the other depends upon our all things considered judgment. 
we have to ask ourselves, what do our times demand? Do they, do they demand more change, more disintegration, or do they beckon for reconsolidation and the restoration of anchors in our liquid world? I, 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 I call myself a conservative Christian because that's my judgment about what we need. But in a different era, in a different time, I might have called myself a liberal Christian. Thank you. So thanks so much, Rusty. We're going we're gonna to take questions. And so you could put your hands up. And uh, if, I w if I can get it started. Um, so Coleridge referred, put the clergy in the, in, the, in the category of the party of permanency. Yes. What do you do when so much of the clergy is now in the party of change <laughs> and you can't even agree on permanent things like what is a woman and what is marriage? As I said, you know, uh, I mean, some, some are, have renounced you know, <laughs> the fixed point of the gospel truth, I mean, clearly. But there are others, you know, for whom they still persist. They, it's for them, it's, it's always 1959. You know, it's always this oppressive, over-consolidated, judgmental. I mean, I remember my mother. My, my mother was pious in her way. And I remember being in the car with her 30 years ago, listening to NPR. Oh, Lord, forgive me, I've sinned. <laughs> uh, and uh, listening to NPR. And it was something about sexual morality. She said, oh. We live in such a puritanical society. And I just banged the dashboard and said, Mom, you are out of your mind. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so in that sense, like I said, Christianity has, uh, there, there, it has resources for a judgment that we ought to empower the party of change uh, over and against the complacent and, um, uh, and, and oppressive uh, party of permanency. But I just think we're so far removed from those times. And so, uh, yes, yeah, some have just given up on the permanence of revealed truth, uh, but others are, um, but others are, I think, persisting in a, an outdated judgment about what our society needs. Thanks. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit further on where populism fits in the spectrum of permanence change, progressive, liberal, and what drives it? Well, populism can be left or right. So there's, no, there's nothing about pop populism is a, is a descriptive term. It's, it's, populism emerges when a significant sector of the population rejects the political leadership on offer. I mean, that's basically the essential definition of populism. You know, you, you have political parties, they give certified candidates, credentialed. This person is a reputable leader. He's, you have a range of options. And when the public starts to say none of the above, you're, you're moving into a populist moment. Um, and like I say, it can be left and right um, populism. Um, you know, I think Peronism is left populism and Trumpism is, or the Freedom Party and in Austria is right populism. Uh, so I, I just don't think it's wise to think of it as a left-right phenomenon. It's a symptom of, of a, a collapsing political consensus, is what I would say. It's, it's a symptom, and more than that, probably a cultural consensus, that the demos is increasingly unhappy, the many are increasingly unhappy with the attitudes and beliefs and policies of the few. And they enter into a rebellious relationship to the few. Um, and we're kind of, we're, we're clearly in that. You know, I think, uh, like in 2016, I think, I, I, I'm a little bit, I'm kind of a bit of a, I mean, my mom, Scotch-Irish, stick in your eye, don't tell me what to do kind of personality um, from Pennsylvania, you know. And um, she, I inherited some of that. But I kind of thrilled to the fact that all the good people were opposed to Donald Trump. It's like, well, if his enemies are my enemies, then maybe he's my friend. And uh, 
So when the reputable people were all saying he's terrible, I thought, well, he used to say that our country's being run by very stupid people, which I thought is a one level obviously absurd and ridiculous. Uh, they're very intelligent. But then I thought, but they have kind of run us into a ditch, haven't they? So, so, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I hope that answers the question. Populism is neither left nor right. It's a symptom. And it'll go away once our political culture uh, re, once our elites start to shift and change so that they actually provide the, pop, the, the populace with choices that they find satisfactory. Where, where in your conversation would you put rationalism and logic? Uh, rationalism's overrated in politics. Uh, <laughs> like I said, um, you know, John Henry Newman, he, in fact, James Madison, he, he always, he, he would talk about theoretic men, and that was a disparaging comment. And uh, same thing for Newman, theory, a theorist, uh, theory was a kind of swear word for Newman. Um, right, that the idea that we can kind of figure out what the right principles are by which to organize um, our society, I think, is, uh, is a fool's errand. Um, you, you've got to you know, patch up the patient, you know, in the, um, in the battlefield, um, you know. I, I have all my friends, well, oh, no, if we have tariffs, um, that will distort uh, economic uh, incentives and it'll lead to da 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 da, da, da. And I say, you're, you're probably right, so, so what's your plan? You know, so what, what's your plan? You know, it takes a plan to beat a plan. It takes a policy to beat a policy. And the policy that in the long run, J John Maynard Keynes famously said, in the long run, we'll all be dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the long run, we won't have a country anymore or we won't have a democracy anymore uh, or whatever, you know. If, so you, you have to patch up the patient in the battlefield, um, and that, that requires, I think, these, these broad judgments about, about what, where the real deepest problems are and where the greatest strengths are. You blow on the embers, try to put out the, you try to put out the dangerous fires, uh, cause the better one, you know, the, the useful ones to burn more brightly. Yeah, I mean, if I could dilate on that. Yeah, principled conservatism. Yes, I mean, never, St. Paul, never do evil that good might come. I mean, I clearly want principles. I want moral principles, um, you know, uh, respect for the rule of law and so on and so forth. But, you know, the, the, we confuse what I call middle axioms, like on the whole it's best, dot, dot, dot. On the whole, I mean, I'm a free market guy. On the whole it's best to let market actors allocate capital and, uh, and uh, on, the whole, on the whole. But I, that's not a principle. That's, I mean, that's an all things considered judgment because clearly, you know, there, there are other times when, um, when you, 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 you say, well, in this circumstance, no, it would be better to have an industrial policy. Um, you know, it's necessary for us to have an industrial foundation to actually make drones um, because if we can't, then if we're, China wants to cut us off, we're not going to be able to produce uh, the necessary weapons to defend ourselves. I mean, will that lead to economic distortions? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes not doing something is, is worse than doing something that has negative consequences. So um, you mentioned that Christianity has a strong God. It's an anchor point. But you said the title of your book was The Return of the Strong Gods, as in plural, so are there any others that might be coming back? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I use it as a metaphor, gods, as in objects that, that win our devotion and loyalty. Uh, I mean, that's a metaphor. I mean, and, you know, clearly um, patriotism, you know, it, it speaks to a strong god, marital love, strong god. You know, devotion of parent to child, strong God. Um, you know, uh, devotion to truth, that's a strong God. Uh, people will sacrifice their self-interest because they just, they won't, they won't betray the truth. So those are strong God, but they're also dark ones. You know, uh, idols, um, perversions that, uh, that people um, throw themselves into. 
and uh, are loyal to, to the, you know, to the harm of the body politic and to the harm of themselves. So that part of our, what I see, part of our vocations, if I'm right, and we're at this inflection point, part of our vocations is, I mean, the, 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 the liberal, the liberal, the, those who are part of the liberal establishment, do they have any credibility when they police uh, the dark web, you know, the internet right? I would say no. I mean, they call everybody a fascist who they disagree with. So it's up to us as patrons of the party of permanency, as conservatives, to actually make these kinds of discernments between the gods that are ennobling, that help us fulfill our humanity and serve our freedom, and those that enslave us and, and are ignoble and debase us. Because we at least have credibility, because we are in favor of love, devotion, and obedience. And, uh, and so we have credibility. So it's going to fall on us, I think, to, to, to stymie the dark forces uh, that are certain to come in, this coming, in these coming decades, I fear. It's going to be incumbent upon us to make those discernments and to stand strong, because the old failed liberalism doesn't have, isn't going to have credibility. Because um, like I say, they've already, they've, already, they've already discredited all that language. I mean, Joe Biden, last year, first paragraph of his State of the Union piece, talking about Adolf Hitler, uh, you know, as in enemies within, enemies without. And you just think, like, whoa, this is so, this is such a debasement of, 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 these, of this language that, that it, again, it's going to fall on us. And we have to figure out a language and a way of thinking about these things that actually uh, make sense in, in, a, in this changing world. You alluded briefly to a couple of inter, we can call them interface debates on the modern right, one of them particularly being okay, markets. Who's talking? Okay, yeah, all right, very good. Yep. Um, when, it, when you're looking at both your, your principle about liberal versus conservative sentiment kind of being a balancing act in certain ways, but also the timeless truths about economic markets, do you think it's more beneficial for conservatism now to be guided by the economic, the more deregulatory principles and philosophies of someone like Ronald Reagan or the more pro-intervention, new rightish economic nationalism espoused by people like, like Orrin Cass at first things? Yeah, I mean, I'm the latter. And again, it doesn't mean that I think that the Reagan uh, policies were mistaken. The, you know, we, as I, I described my parents' attitudes, you know, um, born in 1933, 1934, and these judgments about having an over morally over-consolidated, overly um, uh, censorious, um, and then economic system that was overly consolidated and, and squelched creative energy, that, that, that's a, that was a very, I mean, I was, I was uh, a teenager in the 1970s. It was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a low decade, um, and it was not a happy time. And so the idea of deregulation to, to open things up and to let the creative juices flow, to let these coming of age baby boomers go out and really charge forward. I think that made a lot of sense and the, and the results were good by and large. And um, we're a wealthier country for that. But I just look around and say, well, that's not our problem today. Our, uh, I don't see that as our problem. You know, like a 2% decrease in the top marginal rate is not gonna have a dramatic influence on, on entrepreneurial uh, energy. In fact, I would submit that probably the greatest impediment to entrepreneurship is the decline of the um, family. Um, I think if you did background on entrepreneurs, billionaires, entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs, I think the overwhelming majority come from intact families because it gives them the spiritual, uh, the spiritual independence, the spiritual confidence to take these incredible risks. Um, and and so, and so I. I so I think it's just not our, that, that, that's a old, those are policies for an old time. We live in a, a time when the greatest crisis in our society is failure to flourish among high school educated Americans and people with only a high school degree. Uh, 
That's the crisis. 100,000 people a year dying of drug overdose death? And what is the open society consensus's answer? Legalize marijuana? I mean, really, it's crazy. That is a sign that it is, it is really insane and failing. Um, and so this, and you guys are here, you certainly are a part of the country that has, feels it quite acutely, that that, that, that sort of um, uh, problem in our society, and then we also have record high percent of Americans, rep, record high percent of people living in this country that were not born here. So just before immigration was uh, closed in the 1920s, we were at about 15% non-native born residents. We're back up at 15%. I am not anti-immigrant, but at some point, social cohesion breaks down. Um, you know, is it at 20%? Is it at 25%? I don't know. But it, it just seems irresponsible to be, to be preaching multiculturalism at a time of demographic uh, uh, fragility, if you will, with, with all these We should be preaching, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, united we stand. Um, uh, out of many, one. We should not be engaging in all this diversity talk uh, in the present, given the present demographic challenges. I'm confident. I believe that we can, we can do it. We can forge a, it'll be a different kind of country, given all the demographic change of the last generation. It'll be a different kind of country, but it'll be recognizably this country. And I think we can do it, and we'll be, we could be stronger for it if we do it well. But it's not going to happen by emphasizing all the party of change, open society motifs. DEI, I mean, it's just, this is, a, this is a language that was evolved to deal with an overly consolidated, complacent um, uh, uh, society, whereas we have a dispirited and fragmented society. And so our political, cultural policies need to speak to that problem. And that's the sense when I'm in the Orrin Cass uh, uh, boat. Now, will this solve the problems? Eh, as I said, maybe not, but maybe it just remediates them. Will it create problems? Yes, it will create problems. Um, just like the Reagan consensus has created the problems of our present moment, whatever good things that we might be able to accomplish in the next 10 years will create problems for our grandchildren. It's just, it's called the fall of man, <laughs> right? There are no solutions. I'm very opposed to solutionism. There are no solutions. There are only remediations, adjustments, uh, uh, as I say, bandages on the wounded victim of humanity. Uh, and we can do better than we're doing now, but it's not going to be a solution. One more question. Uh, I guess I'll stand. Uh, good evening, Dr. Eno. Thank you for coming. I just have a, a very quick question for you. So you said throughout the speech that we're nearing the end of progressive confident, uh, confidence. And so as a, as you described, an intellectual journalist, I did want to ask, is there a moment over the past decade or a few moments where you thought we may be nearing the end? Something standing out maybe in 50 years that historians will look back on as a, as a key moment or a few moments? I, I was at a, I mean, I can only speak anecdotally, I think it was a, the pandemic definitely exa exacerbated this sentiment. But I was at a, a dinner at a friend's house, his daughter graduated from college, was working as a cocktail waiter. So what are you thinking about career? I, what's, what's the point of a career? You know, marriage and children. Eh. I mean, the world's gonna end soon anyway, climate catastrophe. And I was like, whoa. I thought, wow. You know, smart young woman, beautiful, smart, attractive young woman, thinking that she has no future. I mean, that's the antithesis of progressivism, right? Progressivism, the future is better. If we just put our minds to it and use our intelligence, we can make a better future. Uh, and, you know, climate catastrophe, um, we know that young people think that the country's more racist now than it was two generations ago. Uh, which is a clear symptom of a certain kind of despair about the future since it's obviously not true. Um, so I just think there are lots of signs out there that young people do not believe in the future. And, uh, and that's the death knell for the party of change because the party of change runs on, we're, it seems crazy, but hey, 
Boys can be girls, girls can be boys. It seems crazy, but it's gonna make a better future. And if, if we no longer believe that the future is, is, is gonna be bright, then I just don't see how you can maintain the liberal ascendancy and liberal dominance uh, that's been so pronounced. Uh, again, I would submit that World, uh, World War I to World War II, what I call the Shoah, a civilizational catastrophe in the West, we think it's a good war, you know, nobody thinks about World War I in America. Uh, we have monuments, but nobody ever thinks about it. Um, World War II, it's a good war. Um, of course, we dropped two nuclear bombs. All right, man, we'll just gloss over that. Um, but I don't, I don't think we can underestimate the, uh, the trauma to Western culture of this rolling disaster from 1914 to 1945. And the compensatory, uh, I would call it, this compensatory assault on, on love and loyalty um, in, the, in, the, um, in the aftermath of this open society consensus. And this demonization of any desire for permanent things, I think is a compensatory um, effort on the part of the West to somehow find a solution never again. One thing young people should never say is never again. Uh, why is this? It's an adage of law. Hard cases make bad laws. Let me say this. Social crises make bad policies. Uh, you should, you know, beware organizing your social and political philosophy around a remedy to a grave crisis. Um, because I think you'll only wind up echoing, echoing in a kind of Mirror, mirroring in a perverse way the very thing that you're trying to um, prevent. Thank you for your time, and uh, uh, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Rusty. A, a couple closing thoughts. One, you said, um, this you shall not touch, right, announces the party of permanency. And I'd like to know what those things are, right? I mean, what, are, what, what do we conserve? What are the permanent things? And what do we tell the other side? You're not touching that, especially when they, as you say, demonize the permanent things, the very idea of permanent things. Also, um, you mentioned disintegration of male-female relations or something like that. Um, Nate Hawkman, an American spectator, has a really good piece out right now on young men are identifying as very conservative. I mean, we're talking like ages 12 to 25. And, it, and it's, it's crossing countries. It's crossing, it's not just white males, right? It's black males as well. And conversely, young women are identifying as even more liberal. So this is gonna be a real big problem. And especially with women going to college and young men not. And I, I mean, this could affect marriage, quite literally, right? I think it is. Actually, it is. All right, so just closing thoughts. Uh, check out firstthings.com, and you should go there every day. You should, you should subscribe. It hits a paywall at a certain point, right? So you got You should. You should. Subs you should subscribe. Subscribe and contribute. Help them out. Subscribe early and often. Er early, early, early and often. And some dates for your calendars: uh, October 29th. Over here at Crawford, we're gonna have our annual Ronald Reagan lecture, and that's gonna be with Governor Scott Walker, former governor of Wisconsin, and he now runs uh, Young America's Foundation, the Reagan Ranch Center, so it'll be President McNulty and I talking to him on the big stage. November 14th, here in this room, we have Colleen Ronchik, formerly with uh, Commonwealth Foundation, and she's gonna be speaking on education. And on December 3rd, at our Rivers Club lecture, our Foundations of American Leadership series, we have Amity Schles is going to be speaking on Calvin Coolidge, which is a great talk, and so you might want to check us out for that. So visit us at faithandfreedom.com and get on our website and be in touch with all of us. And come up and say hi to Dr. Reno. Thanks for coming.